You are listening to the Reraceables podcast. Hello and welcome to the Reraceables podcast. I'm your host Tom. I'm joined today by two very special guests. We have Jerry and Frank from season 32 of The Amazing Race. Give it up for them. So, guys, gentlemen, thank you for so, being here. Thank you for having us. Pre- appreciate uh, appreciate you taking the time. So the pandemic is happening. It's affecting all of us. Sarah, how's your pandemic experience been? I think my pandemic experience so far, you know what? It hasn't been bad. Um, work early on in the year kind of got slow. Um, you really couldn't, I'm in the car business. So of course we really couldn't have that contact to contact, you know, person to person contact, um, which slowed things down a little bit, but it's definitely picked back up. I know we're getting ready to spike again, but we, we've taken all the uh, precautionaries to make sure that we try to stay as healthy as possible. I, I think the one thing you can do is wear your mask. But other than that, I think it's been pretty good um, from my standpoint. Yep, mine also. I've been busy. Of course, I've still been uh, practicing with my team. Uh, we do all that we're supposed to do through the CDC. We wear our mask. Uh, we social distance as much as possible in a basketball practice. We get tested twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday. So at this time, all negatives, everything's good. Uh, we've had a few games canceled, of course. Our first game has already been canceled, so we're hoping to play this Friday. But everyone is just trying to manage this the best that we can. That's all you can do. You know, let's just make sure we keep our head up and do what we can do to keep people safe. Well, how's it affected, like, the on the court? Is it, are people wearing masks during practice? How does that work? Because I'm a coach, too. And, you know, our, our seasons have been pushed back to the spring and they're going to try to throw all the seasons for the school into the, you know, between January and June. And I'm just curious, like what you're doing as far as a day-to-day with practice and that. Well, yes, no, we do wear masks. So do I do also, I make my players keep it on above their nose. Uh, it's tedious. Sometimes they have a hard time though, have to go outside when they really get winded. We send them outside. The weather hasn't gotten too cold yet where they can take their mask off and take a deep breath. Everyone has their own water bottle. We temperature check them before and after. We sanitize their hands after every break. Every break we sanitize. So we're trying to do everything. We're following all the guidelines that the CDC has. Different than you all, I'm only trying to play November, December because we know it's gonna spike in December. I've canceled by January, February, and March. So we're gonna play 10 games this year. And hopefully it's nine now because the first game was canceled, which is tomorrow. And hopefully we can get those nine in, but we're not going to try to play in the spring. We're just going to wait until next fall. How are the kids handling it? They had two seniors and they'll be able to play. One had 12 hours remaining after this year. So they'll be able to play half the season, which is 15 games and not count toward their season. So it's really just a nice little warm up. We'll play seven or eight games shut it down, everybody will come back eligible next year along with the new freshmen. So there's no negative to this for them. And how about you, Frank? How has it been? Yeah, I feel like a big thing for you is looking at somebody and then, you know, kind of having that face-to-face contact. I know it is for me as a teacher. And I, you know, it's hard enough to get kids to talk, but. Like I said, early on around March time, there was a lot of things to where, you know, people couldn't even come in the showroom. So it was very, very limited there's really no point in even having the salespeople there. So a lot of our sales force didn't even come into work. It was myself and another colleague that usually would come in just to do things, you know, on our computers and just kind of handle a little bit of in-store work. Um, So it was really tough. Things have kind of changed now. We can have people back in the showroom. We have plexiglass up on all our desks. So when we're sitting, you know, you're on the other side of that glass. So it just kind of keeps that interaction on. Of course, you have to have your mask on the entire time. We cannot go on test drives. So a lot of the kind of selling points, I feel like, you know, you go on that test drive, you can kind of, wow, look at this. When you're doing this, this is what the car can do. So it's a lot of those kind of things you lose. So you just kind of have to pick that up in other aspects. You have to do a thorough go, you know, run through of the vehicle before they test drive. So they're familiar with it when they're driving and they can kind of see those features on their own. So other than that, it it's, hasn't been too hard. You know, people still want to buy cars. I feel like people have been cooped up. So it's one good thing for us. People do want to come spend a little money because they've been, haven't got to take their vacations and they haven't been able to do those type things. So it's, it's helped us in that aspect. And like I said, things are going back to some type of normality. Um, 
but hopefully it doesn't spike again to where it kind of closes things back down. I know that's kind of been, you know, a slight talk and that would kind of put a sputter on things, but we've been doing everything we can to make sure that things keep pushing. And um, like I said, these probably last three, four months have been really good. So let's just hope we can continue that and, and they don't shut this country back down. But I'm glad to hear that you guys are able to kind of keep things going as best you can. Coach, I, I, I put on the uh, national championship game from 1980. Um, <laughs> thanks to the fine people at YouTube. I had hair. I don't know. I what do you have hair? <laughs> no, you looked good. You look great. You know, take me back to what was basketball then to what it is now? You know, that's a great question. And soft. A lot of the uh, soft. Yeah, you're soft. <laughs> the old players say that this generation. They're not as good. And I'm not going to say that, but I do think that there was more team basketball in 70s, 80s, and 90s. I do think that the level of talent was better because there were less teams. So, Tom, you have to understand, when I played in college, there were less teams in the tournament. The teams that were good were better. They had more players. Uh, my 1982 Final Four is the greatest of all time, and I don't think it will ever be eclipsed when you're talking about Michael Jordan, James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Kim Olajuwon, you got me, Clyde Drexler, Larry yeah. Michel, oh, yeah. Michael Young, Georgetown, Patrick Ewing, Sleepy Floyd, and on and on. Yeah. University of Louisville, when we have seven pros, Georgetown had six. They yeah, all strong. Had five. That time, that will never happen again. That level plus Patrick of Ewing is a senior too, right? Like guys right. staying that long. Exactly. And they're staying. I mean, so and don't forget, UAB defeated Ralph Sampson in Virginia. Then we defeated UAB, or you've got Ralph Sampson in the final four. Right. It, it will never be duplicated. So I think that the talent level, because there are more teams involved, they've added more teams to the tournament, uh, more universities are trying to get into the money pool, which is all this is has lessened the overall talent. You've got super talent at the top, no question. But the average player, and we were making an example, my Utah Jazz team, Carl Malone, John Stockton, that group, compared to teams now. You've got starters that wouldn't make our Utah Jazz team that are starting in the NBA today that would not have made our 12-man roster. You've got 30 teams, 17 players per team traveling. So it's not always... More is not better. More is good for the players, but that doesn't mean the basketball is better. That's all. right. And the same thing for myself when Butch Beard and John Havlicek and Wes Unsell, Paul Silas, who, there were 13 teams. Jerry Eves doesn't make those teams. Do you understand me? I don't make that 13, that 12-man roster when it's 13 teams. I wasn't good enough. So because of more teams, it's helped the players. The money's increased, but it doesn't mean they're better. It doesn't. Frank, you said that it was soft. He's soft. I, hey, I say I say soft in the aspect as, I mean, the type of treatment we get pampered. I mean, you know, I say well, I play back in sixteen. We get pampered nowadays. Back in the day, they were playing converses on concrete ground. Like, I mean, hell, my dad's hips, knees, elbows, <laughs> everything oh. above is shot. It's it's like we have it so easy, and it's just you know, I feel like back in the day you had an issue. You know, you see these little guards run up on these seven foot you know centers now talking crap. Back in the day, they would have just picked them up and like threw them in the stands, you know? That wouldn't have happened. You know, nowadays a little guy feels entitled and, and like, hey, I can run up on this big guy. He can't do anything because more than likely he's not going to do anything. Back in the day, they would have just tossed you. Unless you were Calvin Murphy. Calvin Murphy was knocking people out. It was different. <laughs> Ask Kurt Rambis if he would like to play today when they couldn't body slam him, shoot two free throws, and nobody got ejected. Right. It's right. vastly right. different. No hand checking. It's vastly different. People don't want to admit it, but these little kids playing today couldn't have played when I, I would have helped them, period. Simple as that. <laughs> well, even, I you know, I, 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 <laughs> I look at your, you're both wearing some cool gear there, the Simmons uh, shirt oh, yeah. there, the App State oh, yeah. sweatshirt. Yeah. I mean, how, how much, how many uniforms you got? Like how many Whoa. different types of uniforms you got, coach? <laughs> Man, 20, I, he's got 10, it. depending he's, on the day. He, he stole they've some of my, my Louisville Louisville jerseys. They've taken my Louisville jerseys, but I've got 
I've got New Jersey net, the old net stuff, practice gear. Yeah. I've got everything. I've got the old. No, I'm saying that. I'm saying at Simmons for your program, like to play to for today's player, right? Oh, I feel like the yeah. Oregon Ducks kind of pushed the whole You're college right. landscape You're so into right. helmets. Everybody's got ten different helmets. You know, jerseys. There's no limit. The, the even the court. Look at like Oregon's court. There's like a yeah. forest. Forest. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. No. no, we have. That, do you see that change uh, yes. in your program? Yes, we have way too much compared to what I had at University of Louisville, which we would have gotten two pair of shoes, one practice gear, travel stuff. My team here has two pair of traffic, travel gear, sweats. We've got four sets of practice. They'll get about four or five pairs of shoes. No, I agree with that. And what about you, Frank? I mean, you played at App State, uh, right? I mean, we were, uh, we, we, we had, you know, countless practice jerseys. I probably had in a season, I'd probably get 10 to 15 pairs of basketball shoes. You'd get three pairs of traveling. You'd get a weightlifting pair. You'd get a pair of Air Force Ones, another pair of travel, flip flops, backpacks, with your number on it, another backpack for to participate. It was like we had coats. <laughs> I still have them. I'm like, man, we had a lot of gear. And like, we were like, I would run through some shoes and be like, something like a little shoestring would be starting to like kind of tear a little bit. I'm like, mm, I got to have a new pair. And it's just like, dude, you just needed some new shoestrings, but you'd get a whole new pair because that's just how it is nowadays. Kids get a lot of stuff now. And it's starting it's starting younger. Now, you look at, like, the AAU teams. I mean, hell, mm -hmm. they're getting just as much gear as, as college teams now, which is crazy. Yeah, and it's a challenge as a high school coach. I feel like one of the biggest things I try to focus on is culture and building a, a sound culture that has kids that want to be there to buy in for more than just the sport but to help them become better men, you know, I coach football, um, things like that. But it, I feel like one of the biggest challenges is having to get them there, to get them to want to be a part of the program. And I feel like things like what they see, like the uniforms, like the backpacks, those types of things are essential, right? I mean, so my question is like, how do you guys, whether it's in your business, Frank, or in your team coach, like, how do you guys work to build a, a sound winning culture? Well, first thing is you've got to get them to understand why they're there. And Tom, mine, my school's in the lowest income district in the city of Louisville. And a lot of my kids have absolutely nothing. And when they came five years ago, they thought their way out was come play at Simmons two years and Coach Eves can help them go pro because he was a pro. And, you know, I had to destroy that, that myth, that thought process that runs rampant yeah. in the African-American community and still does, that the only way out, the only way to success is through education. And kids are not sold that. Nike has done a tremendous job. I know Phil Knight personally. I've known them all. Howard White, who was his right-hand man for forever. And they've been really good to me. And they've done a great job of selling kids on Be Like Mike. But there's only one Michael Jordan, one Kobe Bryant. Kevin Durant, you know, we can count and talk about the top 50 and that's over a 50 year period. You can't be like them. It's a lie. Right. So we have to get them to understand. I don't want, I don't allow anyone to get mad when we lose. No one can argue with each other about a blown assignment. Now we watch tape, we work hard and practice, we try, but I told them the only time you can get mad at them is if they're not prepared in the classroom, if they're not ready with their study hall assignment. If they're not ready for the test, get mad at your teammate. But out here, don't ever let anybody, there's no money out here. There's no money to be made on this court other than conditioning, taking care of your body and mind. But that's not what's sold. We know that's not what's sold. Frank, for you and your in your business, how do you try to contribute to a winning culture there? Because it's no different, well, right? I mean, it's, well, you're still I mean, working on a team. It's, it's, it, it is, and it is, well, I say it is, because ultimately, you know, you want your dealership to be at the top that brings in uh, um, more revenue, that brings in more bonuses, things like that. You want to be a better, um, but you know, it's a business within a business, you know, technically I work for myself in a sense, because if I don't sell, you don't make money. Um, so that pushes you to, to strive to be harder, but you know, you do work as a team. And like I say, if there's a you know colleague that has a client and they're out with their wife's pregnant, Pregnant, you know, you do want to help those people because at the end of the day, when he does well, you do well, the dealership does well. 
and you know it starts from the top now the dealership does well it just kind of showers on you so you definitely want to kind of build that culture but like i said it really starts with you because if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing doing your best then it really hurts everybody else because you're kind of hindering the entire dealership so it's a i, I think basketball is more of a team sport as in well, I mean, actually, they're similar in a way because, like I said, you do your part, I'm going to do mine, and that's ultimately going to make the team better. Um, so you have, you almost have to have selfishness within your role, if that makes sense, um, because you sure. have to want to do your part so well that, um, you know, the next man wants to do his part very well, and then everybody does their part very well for, you know, the entire team, the entire, you know, staff is doing well. Right. Kobe Bryant, Michael so Jordan, think- tough love. Because right. the, he had to have their teammates play well for them to win or they could not win. Right. You, you, every individual has to do their job for the group to be successful. I, being an athlete myself and playing sports has really helped me as a teacher to be similar to you, Frank, like doing my role in the best that I can and knowing that that's the only role that I have. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to teach every single kid. I have to just teach my kids, right? You have to right. do your best to do your job. That's it all adds up to a better overall for everyone. So what about bubble basketball? Did it work? Does it work? I mean, did you guys watch? What was your takeaway from so, the bubble well, basketball? You know, you're asking us, it's very biased for a basketball family. So we always have watched <laughs> basketball. I was going to watch bubble. We have a lot of clientele. Mind you, you know, I, I sell a ton of athletes. So we, you know, between Bam, Tyler Hero, I mean, I can. we have so many guys that, you know, I personally work with that sell vehicles too that, you know, you watch them because you love the game, but also to watch your clients. Um, so I think for us, we watched it. I know ratings were way down. Um, I think the NBA pushed, you know, a few kind of matters, the Black Lives Matter being one. I think they pushed it really, really, really hard. Um, mm-hmm. and, and my dad says this to me all the time. He was like, you know, what if a doctor walked into the operation room and says, hey, look, I'm not doing, you know, that surgery today because, you know, they didn't take care of that Breonna Taylor case or whatever whatever case, you know. So there's kind of a very fine line to, you know, still having to do your job, which their job was to be there and play, but also, you know, stand up for what you believe in. But it kind of, I think it kind of threw a lot of people off because they were pushing it so hard. So in a sense, it worked, but in a sense, they lost ratings. And I feel like they've lost some people that are watching from that. Coach? Yeah, Tom, difficult time, you know, the bubble. I think uh, Adam Silver in the league, of course, I'm a part of that league. I'll receive my pension four months from now. I'll be 62. Wow. All right. Yeah, clap that up. I need a piece of that. I need a piece of that. (laughs) That was built. No, nothing for you. You got too much already. But um, people have to understand that there's frustration in this country, and there's no question. And I told Frank, and I've said it before, I have no problem with Black Lives Matter, but I've been Black 61 years, not since 2012. They don't affect me. I understand what they're trying to do, but there's a bigger picture to this. And as for an African-Americans, when you're talking about the NBA, the only reason that we have the league is for revenue. College calls it amateur, so you don't get paid even though there's billions of dollars made. Yeah. (laughs) Then they come together and play pro sports is to earn a living, just like a doctor, just like a lawyer, and everyone is frustrated. I just don't like when players want to put themselves in a situation where they may be giving up economic gains over political issues. There's a place and a time. Run for office. I'm not ever saying shut up and dribble, not at all. I'm saying put your economic impact behind someone who believes in your stance or Run for office. I'll vote for you without a doubt. But at the same time, the NBA is a business to earn revenue. That's all. So I've told Frank that I've had both my hips replaced. And there's frustration all the time. If a doctor walked in and I was supposed to get my hips replaced and he said, I'm frustrated today, I'm not doing it, then I would have a problem with him. I would go to another doctor. That's all that I'm saying. So you have to be very careful when you're pushing in a business that is to make and create revenue when your fans are important, no matter what people say. And, and Tom, this world has to understand the world is always going to be 50, 50. That's just the world. People are going to be split on both sides. It has been from the beginning of time and it will be, but you have to understand 
don't damage the 50% of your fan base that is with you trying to make a point to the 50% who will never care. And they're not ever. You're not going to make a point with them ever. So that's the only thing what I'm saying. I've told Frank business wise and same thing on the race. Frank got it frustrated. I was just glad to be on the race, Tom. Come on, man. Chance of a lifetime for a 59 year old with no hips. Yeah. <laughs> you can do what we did. But I would always keep pushing him certain little things to make him see that in other countries, same time, same date, same place, they don't have the same issues we have. Issues aren't the same around this world. We just have to understand that. Was that so glaring just as you're running on the race? Like, could you just see it from as you're maneuvering and you're traveling in the race? You could see what you're talking about? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you can see that people were happy with a lot less than Americans have today. You know, we're really, really upset when we've got the maximum of the maximum and it's not enough. We cannot share the pie. It is not black, white, green, yellow. It's all of us. We're all Americans. But for some reason, we can't sit back and say, let's just share the wealth a little bit more. Let's understand it's a lot better place than a lot of other places. And it is. I know yeah. you can measure your bushel with somebody else's barrel, but we as Americans are blind because we have so much. And if they would travel abroad, which the NBA players have, you can be in the beautiful, you can be in Manaus, Brazil, or you can be in Bogota, Colombia, or you can be in Manila. And as long as you're on the Gold Coast, it's great. But you get two blocks, three blocks off, you see poverty you've never seen before ever, two or three blocks off. So right. we just need to all educate ourselves more, Tom. That's all. I teach in New York, but I taught in Hawaii. And I taught um, for a short time through an internship in Vietnam. And I, I totally got a broader picture of exactly what you're talking about. You know, I went those two blocks in and worked with those people. Um, whether it was in uh, Oahu or whether it was in Ho Chi Minh City. It, it was a, it's an eye-opening experience, and I can attest to what you're talking about, that you know, kids are kids, and they need the same things, whether we're in America or we're, we're abroad. And, and, um, but you know, that definitely gave me a greater sense of respect and like, appreciation and um, yeah. the ability to lead with gratitude for what I do have more yeah. so uh, than anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, because you need it. You need it. It's life is too complicated. It's too there's too many things that are affecting us to do anything other than I think lead with that gratitude, Pete, um, and that humility. But I'm glad you brought up the race. Let's go there. Talk to me about how you got casted. <laughs> Tell them, Frankie. It was um, like I said, it kind of it fell in our lap in a sense. So I currently work, um, you know, at Bluegrass Motorsports. And one of the owners, I was out in Las Vegas because, you know, we deal with a lot of the athletes. So we were out there for NBA Summer League. I was also, I was playing professionally at the time. So I was out there at the, you know, overseas camp. I had got hurt. So I was hanging out with the boss and his son in their hotel room. Well, his wife is really good friends with the casting lady for Survivor and The Amazing Race. She came to the hotel one wow. morning. And they were just kind of having mimosas, just relaxing. And then she was like, hey, you know, you're, 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 you're a nice looking young man. She was like, how would you like to be on the Amazing Race? And that's exactly how it happened. I was kind of like, oh, you're kidding. <laughs> she's like, she's like, no, I'm not joking. You should go outside and call your dad. So I go outside and call him. He's just like, you're, you're joking. I'm like, no, I'm not joking. Not, not lying to you. Three weeks later, we were in L.A. And we were doing a casting and all this other stuff. And I'm like, what? You know, we're out there with the guys. The guy who does like the hot dog eating contest. There's a whole bunch of people out there trying to interview to get on the show. Um, really funny, funny enough, we didn't make it that season. Right. So they're like, you know, you guys didn't get chosen. So I was like, you know, fair enough. Great experience. Well, they call us the next summer and ask us again. They're like, Hey, would you guys want to be on the show? So we go back out and you know, this time there's not as many people and pretty much, you know, we kind of get straight to the, we're getting shots, things like that. So I'm like, Oh, we got a pretty good chance of getting on. And then sure enough, a few weeks later, they let us know we were on, you know, for season 32. So didn't have to put in any, uh, I said we didn't have to put in an application. We still had to send in a video, but mm -hmm. I mean, we really didn't have to go out of our way to do anything. It just kind of fell in our lap. We had to do, but we had to do the videos and they had to be funny. And I, yeah, had <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> so what did you do for the video then? Oh, you'd have to see it. I'm going to be honest with you. We dressed up to where Frankie put on his, not, he didn't have his game jersey on, but I did. I have my Louisville game jersey on. So Frank, with the shorts, with the short shorts too. The short shorts. He said, I'm, 
I'm new school strategy. And I know how to do. And then I came sliding in just like risky business with my jersey on. Yeah. I slid in my socks and I said, I'm old. <laughs> that jersey was so tight. <laughs> it was tight, man. That thing was uh, screaming. That we were screaming at the boys. I'm telling you, if I put that on air today, we'd get a million hits. I slid in just like your boy Tom Cruise. Boy, was, <laughs> I couldn't breathe. <laughs> oh my god! That's one of the you you got to put that online. Oh my god! You have to put that online. It was crazy. We sent that in, and two days later, they said we're sending you plane tickets, and that's the truth. Yeah. And it was crazy. Wow! Wow! That's that's <laughs> unbelievable. It's it's. I. I I mean, I guess everybody's got that story of how it happens, but that is, that, that's the top one I've heard. So what are you thinking at the start, right? You have this, you get on, you're, you're, you know, you get through, you get cast, you get to the Hollywood Bowl, you're standing in the semicircle. What's going through your mind in that moment? He was getting ready to say, are you all ready? I'm sitting there next to Frank. I'm twice the age of every other contestant, twice now. I'm sitting up there. W A T L. No, I'm not ready. Right. <laughs> I need a, out. No, I was, I need a water break. There, it was, he said, "Go." No. And Tom, there were so many butterflies. That go, it was crazy. It was as crazy. Yeah, there. It was like everybody a, should fly. It's just a super, super show. Period. It was like right before the game. You kind of those little butterflies, but just like intensified by a lot. It was just like. So nerve wracking. Because you had, at least you know for a game, you, you prepare. You know you're good. You know this. We had to do where we we're going, what we were doing, how we we're gonna get. So there's a lot of like uncertainties. And I was like, man, this is kind of, you know, I'm like, he's getting ready to say go. I'm like, this is it. You know, we've done all this leading up to it, and all for this moment. So it was a lot of butterflies, but I was definitely ready to go. See, Tom, they had butterflies. I need a water break and a wheelchair. I was trying to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> they took off running and I was like, how do I keep, I need a wheelchair. I need a bicycle to keep up with them. Those young kids were gone. It was just, boy, the minute Phil said, go with that eyebrow. I'll never forget that. The Hollywood Bowl. I was just sitting there going, this is not. Yeah, it was wild. Real. I mean, for a 59 year old or Tom, Frankie, yes, they're the right age. But right. for me, I'm sitting there going, how many 59 year old? There's not 10 of us probably that's right. ever had this chance. And I just, I mean, I would have loved to have done more legs, but the three legs were very difficult. And it was enough to get a really good experience of the travel and all the different things that Frank had to do, trying to keep up. And Tom, for me, I loved it. I'm be honest with you. It was just, I was blessed yeah, to be on the show. Do you, feel like a at, do you feel like you were at a disadvantage, Jerry? Yeah, because they upped the ante with the, with the running. And before the show, they told us we had to swim. And I was ready. I mean, I was swimming 30 minutes a day straight in an Olympic pool. I was ready to swim. But I wasn't ready for the running. And it was constant and continuous running. And that's the only complaint of when we went in the salt mine. That's like 150 meters straight down and straight up. Yeah, or it was. Basin of the, the Amazon to Mazal. Um, the Manaus. City. Manaus was another, you know, I mean, it was straight up, not, yeah. 10 steps, not 20 steps, I'm talking about straight up for quite a bit. It was taxing on my old body, no question. Frank, did you feel like you were coaching dad through that? Uh, you know what? I was trying to be more encouraging than anything because like I said, he's 59 with two replaced hips, a bad knee. I was like, hell, the fact that he's out here, yeah, he's an Iron Man in my eyes. I was like, all right, yeah, you know, so. You're trying. I was really trying to I was just being more encouraging because, you know, honestly, I was tired too. So I was like, you know, if I'm tired, I know he's really tired. So just to keep, try to keep him pushing, keep him moving and uh, do the best we could. And I think that we did that. I mean, honestly, if we read the clue, you know, we aren't talking to you right now. We're not. We're still on the show. Um, it's true. We're but, still you know, that's just like inexperience. But we, you know, we were right there in the mix. Mm -hmm. You know, him being 60, 59 with bad hips, we were right there in the mix. So I think our athleticism and our, Charisma still had us right in the mix. We just kind of made a, a rookie mistake. When we got there and everybody was getting off the boat, we were right behind. Them. And that was that was team two, three, four, and five. So we were fine. If we had taken yeah. our bat, we were fine. 
So on my blog, I try to have as much fun as I can with it. And one of the things we did before the race was kind of go through some rankings and kind of power rank, put a little like sports talk feel to it kind of thing. And one of the five traits that I, I put with it was athletic ability. I thought that that was going to be a huge factor in, in people being able to keep up as well as um, know-how, as well as endurance. And it seems like those are kind of the things that did play a major factor, but also luck. I feel like luck is a factor, but just oh. how much though is oh. luck? Yeah. Tell him about the, tell him about the cab ride. We right? were, uh, when, we were, when we were in Columbia, you know, first off the run from the airport to the taxis had to be close to half a mile. You know, their elevation is wild. So we're out of breath. We were the last team to get to the taxi. That was fine. I was walking. I we, got all this. we got a taxi, and I mean, it was like a like it looked like a smart car. That's how little it was. And mind you, you know, not only do you have my dad and I, you have our sound guy and our camera guy. So we have four guys plus the driver, and we're in this little car, and we're scraping like the first bump. I was like, man, that's not right. We were scraping for probably an hour and a half, just riding on the back shot. wheels because we were so heavy. The shots were shot. Wheel. Um, it was dangerous. Like all you could smell was burning rubber. Like the whole time, I'm like, this is not ideal. The you know, some you don't see on the that. show. The cameraman said, "Do you all smell that?" I'm sitting in the back, going, "Without a doubt, I was sitting yeah, like, it was half bad. Out. We didn't know if it was going to blow up or not. It had no shocks for an yeah. hour and a half on dirt roads going out to a salt mine in Brazil. It no, was no, Columbia. Columbia, Columbia. Excuse me. Yes, yeah, Bogota. I'm sorry. It was dangerous. So the so the other, the cameraman and the sound guy were starting to get nervous. Is that yes. what you know? Yeah, everybody was kind of nervous. Everybody. Yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, it was bad. It was so really what, bad. What happens if, I mean, I know you, you just get, get a replacement car. You get stuck. No, you just get stuck. You know, it's just, you would have to try to find another taxi. And I mean, we just, went in the wrong direction. And the police yeah. had to stop and turn us around. He was getting close to some serious issues in Bogota. I mean, it was a yeah. nightmare. I'm being honest. <laughs> People have no idea. And they're and it's completely yeah. out of your control, Tom. Yeah. You have it's 12 o'clock at night, Bogota time. It's pitch black. Pitch black. We don't know. We just know we're scraping for an hour and a half, get ready to blow up. <laughs> it was crazy. I'm telling you. <laughs> Not to mention, you know, you're you're you know, racing for you know a million dollars, no big deal. Um <laughs> So what about, um, you mentioned some places that you guys got to go to, right? Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Bogota, Brazil. Did you have a favorite place uh, of, the, of the places you got to? For me, Man, I had, Trinidad and Tobago, yeah. it was so beautiful. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, I mean, I would have to say Trinidad and Tobago too, because the water was just, I mean, it was clearer than the water you drink. It was so pretty, so nice. Brazil was definitely off the beaten path. The Amazon is something I always see on, you know, Nat Geo Discovery Channel. So seeing that in real life was surreal. And, you know, I really enjoyed being out there. But, I mean, those two – I mean, all the places we went were nice, but definitely those two places. Yeah. I mean, for myself, when we were put off in Phil said we were eliminated to be on a boat floating in the Amazon, 45 minutes from any true city, unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable experience. I mean, when we came back, our boat ran out of gas. We docked at a floating gas station in the Amazon and got gas. Tom, Tom, and I'm telling you, my eyes have seen a lot. That show is crazy, crazy. Yeah. A floating gas station in the Amazon. Yeah, and how nice is it to go to the Amazon without being on your computer or your phone? It was definitely, a, it was a detox for sure. You know, at first you were kind of like, uh, I don't know how I feel about it, but now it's really nice to, to look back and say, I got away from, you know, my phone and my computer for a while because, you know, this day and age, my job, if I'm not on my phone or computer, what am I really doing? Talk to me about some of the cultural experiences. Was there something that stands out? I mean, you know, we obviously see what you are all going through at some level, but, you know, was right. there a particular cultural experience that stands out above the rest? I would say when we went to the indigenous tribe, you know, how much discipline the young kids had. I mean, you know, the chief said, sit down. Everybody had their role within their group. I mean, everything was just so serene, so simple. It was just very much like you don't see that in America nowadays. You know, nowadays you tell kids to do something. I feel like they don't listen at all. But these kids sat right down. They did whatever they were asked to do. Just the discipline was on another level. 
and, and like I said, they didn't, you know, the, the leaders didn't have to yell. They didn't have to shout. They weren't beating anybody. It was just very much, I say this, you do it. And that's something I think we miss here in America. Yes, I mean, one was definitely the indigenous people and the order and the discipline that they displayed. Um, they were happy as they could be with their lives. Um, they weren't consumed with things they didn't have or need, they thought they needed. And they just were that moment, that minute, which is really, really good. Secondly, all the communities that we were in, very friendly, wanted to help us. And of course, I understand we had the amazing race pack on and you got the cameraman and the TV, but you could tell people throughout the community, um, there wasn't a lot of social unrest. People were going about their business and seemed to be really, really happy. Do you think anything that you experienced or learned along the race is something that you can bring to your team, either at the dealership or uh, at Simmons? Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, no, I think, like I said, just as far as um, they weren't so worried about what they didn't have, they worried about what they could control. Um, just as far as how they work together, like I said, there wasn't a whole bunch of yelling, screaming, beating, everybody just kind of fell in order and did what they were supposed to do. And I think that made things very simple for how things ran. And I think that with the team or the dealership, when things kind of fall in order like that, people do what they're supposed to do, it runs very smoothly. So I think those are the main things I can take back um, to my job. Yeah. I just, as for being able to work together because the show makes you interact with people and puts you in an environment that you're uncomfortable. You don't understand the language. They don't understand understand you you're trying to communicate with them really quickly because you're trying to win a million dollars you're trying to compete so yeah. sometimes you're short they don't understand it makes you take a step back to see if you can inform them of what you need and see if they can help you quickly it brings people together which is great for a team it really is because everyone's not always has the same purpose on basketball floors some people have different agendas same thing with life and the show really helped me because we had to communicate with so many people when we're in the marketplace, so many cab drivers, so many situations when you're trying to figure it out with the clue. Uh, when the young man told us we did not have our machete, we get back the second time, he tells us we we're missing something else, which frustrated us because the first time we had everything but the machete. So it just gives you an opportunity to try to make sure that, and, and Bertstrom did tell us that we were representing United States also, and not to go over there with an attitude that we were better. And I thought that was a huge point that we yeah. were there trying to make sure. That's why I told everybody, thank you, sir, shook their hand, because I wanted them, them to know that I appreciated what they were doing also. Of course. If you watch some of the older seasons, you know, there's some different characters that definitely uh, didn't get that memo, but that's, I think that's the better way to go about it too, because if you're nice to people, if you're aware of where you are and, and, and the approach is to respect people, I think it'll come back to you. And it seems like that definitely was the case. So how much do you actually get to enjoy the places that you're going to? You're going on these, you know, it's once in a lifetime, once in a million lifetimes, but you're also yeah. racing, right? You are in a hurry. You are trying to get to where you got to be to get to the next place, to get to the next, blah, blah, blah. And how much do you actually get to enjoy where you are? I think you can get caught up in the race and not and forget where you are. But my dad did a good job of slowing me down uh, throughout the legs. He was like, just look around, take this all in because this is once in a lifetime. And, you know, that, that, that's something that he brought to the table. You know, I was always very much a young guy to get this done fast. But he's just like, just take a step back and, and just see where you really are. You know, win, lose, or draw, there is no lose because look where you are. You know, look, at your, look what you're doing, you know, the opportunity that we had. So, honestly, uh, taking a step back and just really getting a chance to see where you were, what you were doing, where you were, he did a good job of slowing me down and taking that in. I mean, Tom, that's just a fact. And I understand that – my position in life was different than a lot of them. As for financially, you know, the million dollars was not the driving factor for me. It just wasn't. Um, the opportunity to be with my son was huge and the other contestants. And I've had contestants reach out to me just about things that I've said through them along the way that encouraged them because I was in a different place. I understand that. But I made sure that Frank understood that sometimes you just gotta slow down, open your eyes because what we were seeing 
was incredible. Yeah. And the places that the race takes you and the environment that the race puts you in is just something that sometimes, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure everybody wants to win the million dollars and I would have loved to have another million dollars. Or I'd have to split it with that net. 500, 500, but, <laughs> but I'm going to be honest with you. My three legs was worth more than gold. Not close. Um, Tom, I was speaking to a really good friend of mine and I'm talking about six, $700 million man. Got me. And mm -hmm. he asked me about the show. And I told him, I said, I know you've been to X. He stopped me and said, no, I have not been. Made me go crazy. And this man's worth $800 million. He says, no, I've not. Right. It let me know right. that I was in environments and places that you would think money would buy, but it hasn't. Right. And to do right. it in a group with my son, one, but the other teams, I love them. Good people, you know, wanting to yep. compete. It just, uh, it needs to be two hours and they need to slow it down because Tom, you all missed the best part of the show. They have to edit so much that you really right. don't know how good the show is. You really don't. Yeah. Well, and that's part of my motivation to to write my blogs, to have these, to reach out to to you guys and and have this type of dialogue and conversation because I know there's more to it. You know, there is these other stories and these other uh, interactions. Like there was one between Nathan and D'Angelo about uh, breast cancer. That was like a secondary clip on Facebook, and I was like, oh, that would have been exactly. so great to see. Exactly. You know? yeah. um, exactly. The most challenging part, you mentioned your, you know, your, your double hip, or was it your double knee or hip replacements double hip, or double hips, double <laughs> hip. I mean, was, was that the most challenging part or was the language or the never endingness of it, you know, kind of that endurance piece? What was the most challenging part of the race? Uh, the physical aspect is huge. Yeah, and I'm, is. I'm, I'm in decent shape to be 59, but the physical aspect is really, really huge when you're talking about the stairs, which affects my hips. If everything was flat ground, or when you're talking about down into the cave and out of the cave, those things affected my hips more than, there was this, a part when we left the cave, uh, when we were in Bogota, where we were running. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, I absolutely ran by a lot of the contestants, flat ground running. But when you start mm -hmm. to put in the elevations, it brings into my limitations. So that was one was huge. We had a little plan, Frank and I, we had a little plan that he was going to do the first two or three challenges, which as you see, I need to get Frank and my other son on. I'll put a million up that they win, Tom D. I told him that <laughs> I'm telling him publicly, hands down. But we had a little plan that where Frank would take off and get one of the front cabs. And then they still couldn't leave until I got there. So it wasn't an advantage, but they started to hold us back after episode leg three. We had done it twice. They said you had to stay mm -hmm. within 15 feet of each other, which then wow. meant we're getting back cabs, we're getting out slower, we're getting caught in the traffic. Frank was yeah. the fastest. He beat D'Angelo, he beat them all. They'll tell you. He would always get a front cab. Still wouldn't leave until I got there, but it gave us an advantage when I did get it. And that kind of hurt us. Frank, most challenging part for you? I'd say the most challenging, <laughs> challenging part for me was slowing down I think that we didn't read all the clues sometimes and that's part of our mm -hmm. inexperience but you know you read something and you feel like you're behind so you're like oh all you read is the first you know two sentences you're like all these items get them okay cool you know you just take off running you don't read the back side of the paper you don't read the other clue and I think that was the ch most challenging part and I say it sounds so easy but in the environment when you're hot you're tired you're sleep deprived you're hungry um, you start to miss those little things. And I feel like that was one of the most challenging parts was just trying to keep focus um, when you were tired, hungry, and all those other things, as well as trying to compete and be fast. Yeah. See, Tom, they don't show you everything. When you get the clue, there's money in the clue. There's a lot in that envelope that you have to organize. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you grab the main piece of the clue and you read it, but you have to take the time out at the same time. Frank would start to get the items. I would start to count the money because the money is important. You've got to negotiate with each person you buy. So there's not just, oh, you didn't read the clue. There's a lot going on. You have to keep all the clues from all the segments in your fanny pack. So there's a lot. It's cumbersome when you're trying to race around. And especially when Frank's trying to carry me because I'm a little slower from spot to spot. 
So it's not what people think. The clue we read after we had got all the items did not say take the bag. The clue, that clue was in the item before, not the item when the gentleman gave it to us, we opened it up and said, go Prince Quinone or whatever. It wasn't in that right, clue. Right. It was when before that. So they do a great witches. They do a great job with the show of making sure you stay on top of your P's and Q's. That's where our inexperience hurt us. And as you well know, you have people that said they watched every episode. Well, I'm watching mm -hmm. it now because it's a great show. It is a right. great show. But those yeah. kind of things, those kind of things. Alliances come in in episode three on the third leg. It, it, it became, you know, as the viewer, it's one of the biggest things that we see. We see that the, the, kind of those, the first five from the previous episode that were in that group mm -hmm. kind of uh, become an alliance. Didn't seem like you guys had taken a, an alliance with anyone from what we could see, but was that ever part of your strategy or was it just never, it was just worry about yourselves? Yeah, we were more worried about, I feel like just our team and, and running our race. Alliances can play a role, but I think, like I said, we wouldn't be talking today if we just read our clues, things like that. They, you know- We didn't make a mistake. I guess they were good to have, but they weren't necessary. They're not super necessary, if that makes sense. Um, we just kind of want to stay neutral, do, run our race, do it the best we could. And maybe you do make alliances, maybe help. But I just feel like even without making alliances, we just read our clue, do what we're supposed to do. We're still racing. Right. Because we did not know they made an alliance, Tom, and that was fine. Uh, the second leg, when you're going to the salt mine, we could add alliance with everybody there. We were going to be last to the salt mine. Our camp was awful and he didn't know where he was going. Nobody's fault. It happened. So if there was a U-turn, if someone wanted to, they could have done that. It was out of our control. Uh, the third leg, it, the U-turn, if we don't forget our bag, we arrive with everybody else. And the clues that we had to do, the cooking in the hut were no problem. So no, right. it would have affected us at all. Sometimes it's just the luck of the draw, which we put ourselves in harm's way by not taking our bag. But it would have been good to know further into the show, I think, alliances start to build more but our mistake was our mistake and so you get to the the u-turn and you see a picture up what's the what's the thought there <laughs> uh like i said we were we had already went through a lot for that day so we were tired but it was like we come we come this far let's just knock this out no no reason to have self-pity feeling bad for ourselves um we can sit here and cry about it that's not gonna get this challenge done so really just kind of diving into it we really didn't even think much about it. He's like, oh, let's go grab his stuff and do it. So it was very much just take it heads on and get it knocked out. And again, when we said go get the bamboo to make the roof, that was a long way away, Tom. And it was a mad <laughs> we had to take it up, Tom. And it's hot as it can be. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm telling you, they don't show you all why people can miss things. I don't know why, because we had to go all the way back down to the shore, grab With the sand, bamboo, yep. pull it all the way up the, I mean, all the way up a huge hill to start to build uh, the roof. So it's yeah, just it not nice there waiting for you. You've got work to do in between. But I told Frank, when I saw the pictures, I said, well, hell, we look good. Let's go get it done. What the heck? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. So um, you, you get to the mat, in the first two legs and you're not the last team, uh, but then uh, you're on the boat in the Amazon and you're, you know, you step on the mat and Phil says you're the last team to arrive. First off, the, the reflective moment that you guys have is pretty powerful. As a son to a father and just envisioning myself with my father on a race and in this incredible scene, I really just appreciated that much more, that moment that the both of you had. I thought that was really, uh, really special and really, really came through pretty profoundly. Oh, when you think back on that moment, I know it was two years ago. How does it hit you today, this much time later? Yeah. Well, you know, it hit me, like I said, uh, at the moment, just because like we were, you know, doing something that most father's sons don't get to do. Spending that time to bond, you know, we lost. We were still together the entire time. Uh, more than anything, I hope that people watching it, it really opened up their eyes because I feel like so many people you know, take their son, take their fathers for granted and just really don't take that time to really think like, man, this is, this is my family. It's my blood to really, you know, love them like they should. So I, I hope that viewers really took that 
and it changed somebody's life out there, even if it's just one person. Yeah. And Tommy, it was tough for me, um, being honest with you. Um, you know, you try to raise your family a certain way. You know, that's your number one goal as a dad. And, you know, everybody, you, you chase a lot of things, wealth, fame, you know, the human things, material things. But, you know, you always try to make sure that your family understand what's right, what's wrong, try to explain things. But you know, just the opportunity to be with Frank and to watch him carry himself with dignity and represent the family so well, you know, it was just a blessing for me, just being honest with you. Um, when we went on the show, I told Frank, I said, win, lose, or draw. You know, we're going to show people that there's a right way that you have to do things. And there is. Um, a lot of times, I think the reality TV takes over to where you see so much of the nonsense. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just so much of the, of the nonsense sure. that they play over and over and over and over. And, you know, just to hear my son say that he was appreciative of what I tried to do. And I did nothing but hold him back. I got told you, I got a million dollars. And they put Anthony and Frankie out there, Tom, you go on and bet on the Eves family, I'm trying to tell you. Right. But I, I was just right. proud of him and, you know, the growth that he's done and all the things he's accomplished. So, you know, I was just crying because it was nothing but joy. I mean, I'm on TV. I got Phil talking to me. I got my son <laughs> next to me. I'm in the Amazon. And I just wanted people to know life's good as hell. And I mean, yeah. it just is. Well, it came across, Jerry. That's that's for sure. It definitely came through, and and I I read you loud and clear. So, what happens then from the boat, right? What happens after that moment? Hot shower. Right. <laughs> we gotta go. Back, we gotta go back to. We gotta go back to a hotel in Brazil and hang out and do some fun stuff. We did. You, they took you, care you, of us. Like, uh, sightseeing or like uh did you stay there no, we, what 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 happened next yeah we ended, we ended up staying for what another day or two yeah i mean yeah. hang out at the pool we 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 got to take a boat ride in the amazon we were swimming with dolphins in the amazon i mean wild stuff just hang uh, out it was so fun uh, hey, the race took care of us the things we did when we got put off were almost better than the race i'm telling yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and every team doesn't get wow. to say that so don't tell everybody Dom, right. <laughs> that's great. Boy, we take did care it. of us. We've got video that's wait till the show's over and we get all the video. We will post that. Amazing, man. Amazing. Just awesome. just the after you in Brazil and, and that mm -hmm. whole little uh, mm -hmm. that little journey there. Yes. Wow. So um, what's next? What's next for you guys? Uh, travel wise? Well, is this, uh, is there a new itch to be scratched with, with this piece of family vacation? I would say, what, I would what's say happening? We, we, we've talked about it. I've had people from, you know, who we met in Trinidad Tobago reach out to me on Instagram saying like, you know, you guys should come back and things like that. Of course, their borders are still closed and with COVID, you kind of want to lay low, but when things open back up, I'll definitely be making a trip somewhere like that with the family. Absolutely. Uh, there's no question. I can't wait to take my wife to some of the places so she can understand better why we left our bag. Because our my wife was like, "How'd you lose to leave that bag?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, my wife was like, "How'd you leave that bag?" <laughs> I'm like, "I'm gonna let That's you great. see why we left that bag." <laughs> no. Uh, well, well, thank you guys. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing the stories and the experiences. Um, on the podcast. Is there anything that you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Appreciate you, man, for having us on. Yeah, thanks for having us on. And uh, you should try to get on the show if you can. <laughs> well, Frank, I mean, if you could, you know, put a put a, put the good word in with that contact that you had, you know, <laughs> uh, over at the hotel. Now, I'm open to uh, the amazing race as well as a survivor situation. So. Oh, you're survivor? Survivor, no way, amazing race. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate you guys. Uh, pleasure talking with you. You too. It really was. And I, and I hope to Thank talk with you again soon.